So welcome, Kate Northrup. Welcome. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to connect with you and so nice to meet you if we're new to each other. So we're going to have a conversation today, which is the conversation that you and I really seem to find so juicy and love having. And it has to do with expanding our capacity to receive, because let's face it, at the end of the day, that's the work. And whether people think they came into this program because they'd like more money in their life, whether they came into this program because they want to step into their potential and have a bigger career, whatever the wanting is, it comes from the same place, which is I want to expand my capacity to allow more abundance into my life. And you have been such a master of leading people through that looking glass. And so I'd love to just have this conversation with you. First of all, as I say that already, what's coming through that you want to name or share about that? Yeah, so I love the sort of the intersection of your work and my work <clears throat> because we're a hundred percent on the same team and then we come at it at slightly different angles. So I'm just really happy to be here and I have learned so much from you and a uh, couple, same. I don't know, first week of January. I mean, no, no, it was in November. In November, I was doing a day of podcasting um, and I record in studio. So I had a guest there who had just been on and I was recording a solo episode, but she was in the studio just doing some work. And I was like, I was like, I don't know what to record a solo episode on, even though I have 3 million ideas at all times. <laughs> um, she was like, I know will you record this one for me. And she said, like, actually, like, actually, what are the steps to expanding your capacity to receive? That was literally her exact question. And I was like, I can, I can, I can tell you the steps. And I, again, come at it from a very body centered place. So I was a dancer. I was a yoga teacher. Um, I am a very much like an in the body person. So if you are somebody who is also an in the body person, this may be really helpful. If you're someone who's not in your body, this might be new and that's really great too. <laughs> there are many, many roads in and the road that I primarily choose is through the body. So what's coming through is just to begin with, Many of us don't open ourselves up to receive because it feels unsafe to do so. And it's not just like as simple as we'll just open wider. <laughs> There's like so much unconscious. So I find it really helpful to kind of explain some of the mechanics of what's happening in our body and our nervous system when we want to open to receive, but we feel ourselves closed. Have you, Kathy, found yourself ever in a position where there was something you really wanted to fully receive, but you could feel yourself keeping it at bay? Like you could feel yourself, it was there, but you were like, couldn't let it in, even though you wanted to? Totally. Yeah. Many times. And yeah. especially doing this work, you become more and more aware of like, wow, I'm sabotaging that. That doesn't feel good. You know, I had this brunch at my house on Friday and it was so beautiful. I saw the it on Instagram. It looked really yummy. I mean, the flowers alone, I could have just looked at for 19 hours and the candles and the food was delicious and right. healthy. And the people in my living room are wonderful people and the view and my cats. And I was talking to our friend, mutual friend, Tracy. And I was like, I was aware that after a certain point, I like couldn't receive anymore. Like I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm like not even able at this point to take in because we only, we, we, we have a certain set point for how much nourishment, how much of a capacity before. I mean, a friend of mine over the weekend had this incredible experience and then the next day felt like garbage, right? Because 
this is the big leap. <laughs> like this is the work is how can we learn to allow in? And what you said is so powerful, which is already such a mic drop, right? We just might not feel safe enough and we might not realize that. I would like to say to you though, before you go further, right. I think it might be really helpful because it's so lovely to really feel that this person knows where you're at. Yeah, a little, little context. <laughs> I just feel like it's because you're in such this exquisite vibration in your life at this point. You have really like went through the Amazon rainforest and had mud on your hands and like got into this place where you can just enjoy on such a level. And you at one point in your life, I mean, I think that the 3D aspect of where you were at with money, with debt, where I think people knowing where you were up against yourself in this is going to make it so much more powerful as you turn, sort of walk us through the portal. Okay, so great. share a little bit of that. Yeah. So I'm going to share um, three particular moments that actually happened decades apart, but they're the same. And I share this because I believe that we each have a life curriculum and some of us are going to like really be in it and our greatest growth is going to come through relationships. And for some of us, it's going to be uh, around money. And for some of us, it's going to be around health. And for some of us, it's going to be around our relationship with God. And, you know, obviously we're all playing in all those different areas, but some of us just have a particular curriculum for whatever reason, I came in with a bit of a curriculum around money and some other things which we can talk about, but specifically money and relationship, money and marriage and, uh, and money in the masculine specifically. And so I say that because these three particular moments are all indicative of a higher level or an expanded consciousness and capacity around that life curriculum. I personally, I like to call it the upward cycle of success where we revisit the same curriculum many, 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 many times perhaps throughout our entire life. And when we revisit similar lessons, we can come at them from that more expanded, like, wow, that's so cool. Five years ago, I would have really not seen this or behaved in a really unconscious way, but now I still I'm encountering the same problem or similar, but now I can move through it faster or with more, with more consciousness or with more love or less fallout or whatever it may be. I think there can be really a tendency in personal development or healing work to be like, oh my God, I thought I healed this. So I start with that. I am like very interested in our cyclical nature as humans and in, in uh, healing the part of us that has been brainwashed into thinking that life is linear. It's so, um, such a good point. Powerful. So. Okay. Yes. Just like the season. So many damn layers of the onion. I see you, Betsy. Totally. Okay. So mm -hmm. in my twenties, uh, I got myself into a lot of credit card debt. I was super unconscious with my money and I was reading a lot of really great spiritual money books, like the, uh, the dynamic laws of prosperity by Catherine Ponder and the game of life and how to play it by Florence Scovel Shin and um, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill and I loved those books. And basically my understanding, which I now see was a bit of a misunderstanding, was I thought I was given the instructions act as if, which I was, but what I took that as is spend as if. And so I just sort of spent money as if I had the kind of money that I wanted, but I didn't because I was in my early twenties and I was just getting a business going. So it made total sense, but I was really skipping over uh, the steps of, of financial stewardship and financial maturity to pay some attention, especially in that time of my life to what was coming in and what was going out. And I was giving my power away through financial unconsciousness. And my avoidance was a result of essentially being ambivalent and afraid of my power. 
which one of my mentors, Barbara Stanny, she's now Barbara Hewson, but she wrote Overcoming Under Earning and Sacred Success. And her most recent book is Rewire for Wealth. She says that women's ambivalent relationship with money is often related to, well, she says it's related to, which I like the, I like the straightforwardness of that. So we'll just plant it that our relationship with money is related to our ambivalent relationship with power. And I love that. Is- I could hear you say so that good, right? over and over again. Type it's- a one in the chat if that just wakes you up. Woo. <laughs> okay. <good>. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just say it again. Our ambivalent relationship with money is a direct result of our ambivalent relationship to our power. Yes. And specifically for women, uh, that's relevant and, and, also, you know, other particular backgrounds and particular in, insert the intersectionalities because we have to understand the historical context. We don't need to keep talking about it ad nauseum, but to just understand the historical context of like in historical time, it was, it's been very recent <laughs> that women have financial power. In the year 1975, my granny became a widow and she was not able to take out a credit card in her own name without my uncle, her son, co-signing. I can't. I mean, right? It's so she had recent. raised six children. She had a log cabin business. I mean, she, <laughs> <laughs> she just 1975, 30 seconds ago, right? Like that was 30 seconds ago. Okay. So anyway. I too had that experience of, I, I think unconsciously I knew how powerful I could be. And yet I was afraid of that. So I did all this financial avoidance, putting my head in the sand, being essentially a little girl around my money, because I was afraid of what might be possible if I fully got in the driver's seat. So Mm. eventually I realized my financial unconsciousness was creating so much stress and dissonance and misalignment in my life in front of the scenes. I looked like this really successful kind of up and coming entrepreneur and behind the scenes, my financial life was a mess. And I was really embarrassed that there was a mismatch there. And so, but all the financial literacy books I was reading felt really shame-based and Mm -hmm. really like you're bad and you need to get it together and you need to get disciplined. And I was just like, (laughs) it doesn't feel good. I just, I feel like I'm in trouble. And I could not get myself to take positive financial action to track my spending, to do what you do to make the calls I needed to make to get a a debt repayment plan together. I couldn't get myself to do it from the place of Yes, Lori, it's so true. It's like diet culture from shame and yes, blame yes. and restriction, right? It just was like that. This doesn't, I want abundance. So I need to do this from a place of abundance. And so I started to combine my financial awareness and financial stewardship with seeing it as self-care and self-love practices. So I started doing money love dates where I would sit down, I would put like kombucha in a wine glass. I would light a special candle. I had a playlist for it. I would put on this specific underwear. Like I really made it a whole thing. And as a result, and there were multiple steps to this. and, And I wrote a book called Money, A Love Story, really describing so much more of it, but that was just a little bit of it. I did things like instead of calling my debt debt, I called it invoices for blessings already received. So I created a whole environment around financial awareness that felt yummy and juicy and expansive because I know that how we do things is what we get. And we will engage in behavior when it feels good, not just because we have to. You know, I think there's those, those, those three steps of habit formation. One is like, make it appealing Two is make it obvious. Three is something else. And so anyways, I don't know. (laughs) So anyway, that long story short is that I was able to pay off my debt in six months and double my income and, and double my savings. And it wasn't because I got some high paying job. It was because I made such a dramatic, energetic and emotional shift that 
my behavior shifted. And of course, my point of attraction shifted very dramatically. So I, I share that with you to know that, and by, by the way, just, just for relative speaking, at that time I was making $34,000 a year and the amount of my debt was $25,000 a year. So in the life I live now, it would be actually like not a big deal, but it everything is relative. Money is not just money. The way we feel about money is about the stories we are telling about it. And I share the numbers so that you understand, like it was nearly as much money as I was making a year was how much this debt was. So it was, it was a lot. It it's, felt like a lot. it's gorgeous. And, uh, so many of the comments are just reflecting how you're naming, you're really able to be in it, like right in the spot that they need you to see them. So I'm so grateful that you're sharing that because we all do have different journeys and we all get caught up in different thickets and different things. And um, I've had plenty and I continue to have plenty of those cyclical learning lessons. Um, but I really do value that you share the debt piece because I never had that piece. And so it's hard for me to teach how to get out of debt because that wasn't my thing. Although there's plenty of other ways that I've learned how to have a different relationship with my power and with money. And over the years, those are the things that I do love to teach, but it's really important that you can name that because you can't help someone out of a well if you've never been there. And so for those who have had that feeling of like, I feel like someone's yelling at me or shaming me. And now I don't want to take better care of my finances, just like with a diet. I, I just love that you are where you are now and are still willing to be courageous and vulnerable enough to completely unveil where you were. And I want you to say a little bit more about that sentence, the stewardship, mm. the power, like I'm already like so excited and what's even in there? Unpack that for me. What does okay. that mean that you were yeah. being ambiguous or not looking at or not wanting to step into the stewardship and the power? Tell me more about what that wound up meaning for you. I love this question. I really have a sweet spot with women who look really successful on the outside or have a tremendous capacity for success externally where there's a mismatch for how powerful they feel on the inside, especially around their money. And that may be someone here today. It was certainly me. <laughs> and we will dim our light in an infinite number of ways, right? And it's going to be different for all of us. For you, it wasn't being in debt, right? That wasn't your thing. I've done it in a number of other ways as well, but this particular one, it wasn't so much the debt that was an issue because I have a whole philosophy about why debt isn't nearly as much of a problem as our as our culture thinks it is. Agreed. And it's actually like Agreed. incredibly it's, helpful in certain agreed. ways. Agreed, it's there for you, exactly. do a whole other, and maybe yep. we'll come back to that. Um, Cause I just think the shame and we carry around is like, it like, yes. it just doesn't matter. Agreed. And mine was a result of a of, of financial avoidance. So financial avoidance looks like having no idea how much I was spending having no idea how much I made at any given year, except for the one day that I got my tax return back from my accountant, um, having no idea how much I owed to the various credit card companies. I just was like in total spiritual bypass. Now for other people, I want to say this is that, uh, how do I want to say this? I don't think we all need the exact same behavior to heal. It was really critical that I get super dialed in about my financial tracking and consciousness from a place of love for my own development. I don't think that that's critical for everyone's journey, but if you are listening and there's a ping in you that you're like, that's important for me. Just listen to that. And if if it's not for you, it's not for you. And that's also completely fine. I know plenty of people where it works great with a bit more of a. Well, I think it's like somebody who's used it. Or, we, we already you know what I mean? The, the food analogy. It's like, yes. I, have a, I have a friend who had 
gone through severe eating disorders. And so then she found a million different things and now she does intuitive eating. So she's like very intuitive of what she, and like, for some of us, we've had a million other ways of sabotaging ourselves, but not with food. And so like mm-hmm. when people tell me that they like think about food a certain way, I'm like, oh my God, I like, if I start thinking about food, then I will have a problem with food, right? Like everyone yes. has different stuff with different things, but yeah. how cool to sort of look at the buffet of all the possible ways that you could get into finding your healing. And so keep going because for okay. someone, clearly this is a thing and you have found such a masterful way of, of, of being with it. So go ahead. So it's really to, I mean, listen, we live here on planet earth. Many of us live in the United States, though. I'm sure we're an international crowd, but I'm assuming in the country you live in, like you need to pay taxes. Right. So there's a certain (laughs) amount of 3d money stuff. And then like, when you go to get a mortgage, you've got to fill out that paperwork. They got to know stuff. So you've got to be able to like know these things. It's part of, it's the same thing. Like your house needs a foundation and there's right. a certain level of, of grounding structure, like Capricorn energy, healthy, masculine, loving father energy that this can provide in our lives. And for those of us like myself, who didn't have as much of that provided by my caregiving situation, it's been incredibly healing for me to bring it in myself and allow myself to receive the healthy masculine structures of loving financial stewardship, like almost the reparenting fathering that I needed that wasn't available to bring that into myself. Like I have felt it heal me on a cellular level. So what does that actually look like? Loving financial stewardship. Every Friday at 8.30 AM, my husband and I, who's also my business partner, Mike and I, we sit down and we have our money love date. I'm still going. It's like 20 years later. And we sit down and we make it fun. I look forward to it. And we go over our numbers for the week. We update a software that we use where we track everything. We take all the incoming that came in from the week and divide it up in these specific percentages according to a system that we use called Profit First, which I'm happy to talk more about that or you can send me a DM. <laughs> but there, we like do these specific things very similar to people who talk about their morning routine. And the way that sets them up for success, we have these financial practices that allow us to essentially, and and I can get into the nervous system if we want to, but for me, it's deeply orienting because I feel like I can feel where I am in space and time financially, and it makes me feel really safe. And I know that when our nervous systems feel safe. When our bodies feel safe, there's a resonance in our energetic field that allows us to be much more powerful manifestors. And what we call in then also has a frequency of safety when we are feeling safe and whole. When I was in financial avoidance, I was really in an addiction to financial chaos which made me feel alive because that was the environment I was raised in. Mm -hmm. And our bodies crave the environment we were raised in and we will continue to recreate them because I heard this, I think from Britt Frank, but I could be wrong. But the quote is, our nervous systems will choose a familiar hell over an unfamiliar heaven. Mm. That. Is so but powerful. the good news is our nervous systems are totally plastic and we can update them. So yeah. that's not in any way, some kind of, I can't think of the word, but, um, doesn't have to be what is it's just a, exactly. Yeah. Right. I, like I, I, until you update them until you choose something exactly. new and we're wired for survival. And then we just need to bring in the wiring for thriving. Yeah. It reminds me of last week I hired this friend uh, who also was a student in in our classes who happens to live in LA and she has a professional organizing business and I had been putting off going through the garage and it just feels very similar and 
we went into the garage and we open up the garage and we're standing in front of my house looking at the garage and I'm just like already like <laughs> just so overwhelming and she's got a box cutter and she has an assistant with a box cutter. she's like you want a box cutter and I'm like whoa like where do you begin what's happening in here and she's like just take one box and so we spent five hours in that garage and at the end of five hours there was so much peace in my body because we had gone through about 30 boxes. There was a whole section of things that we were donating. There was a section of things that we were keeping. And it's, it is the same power that you find when you stop avoiding something and you're willing to lean in and start to look and start to put things where they go. And it changes everything. Like the amount of new thoughts that I had about my life from cleaning out the garage, you can't believe it. It can't, it, 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 there's no way it would seem linear that. that I would no, have no, the it 10 is. thoughts I had afterwards because we went through that garage and we're not completely done, but we're half done with a two car garage filled with things and boxes and extras and cords and mattresses. I mean, it was just so healing for me. And at one point I just was like in tears. I was just like, I don't even know what these are about, but like, this is what you're talking about. We it do is. this with so many things. So why would we think we don't have this with money stuff? It's the yeah, same mechanism. Like, we're scared, you know, essentially, you know, at the end of the day, fundamentally, any behavior we find ourselves engaging in that we don't want to engage in, but we can't help ourselves is because we are scared. That's we right. are, it actually feels safer to our unconscious to engage in that behavior than it does to engage in the behavior that we would like to be engaging in. So, you know, with the garage example, it feels safer for many of us to just close the door of yeah. the garage and not go in there and not look at that and then just pretend it doesn't exist why? Because our stuff has energy, right? The entire philosophy of feng shui, which I used to be a, a feng shui consultant in New York. So I dealt with people and their stuff all day long. It talks to us. It all has a story. It all like are in the, in, in many, many cultures, they, we believe, I, I believe this too, even though it's not necessarily part of my culture, but then like everything has energy and it is talking to us and we just the same thing as our money. And we are afraid to feel what's going to come up when we get in there. But like you, Kathy, it was such a perfect example. Like, it's like, I'm going through boxes in my garage. Why am I crying? I don't know. Good news. Doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter why, exactly. but you got the benefit of moving through an emotional stress loop. So our nervous system gets imprinted by all these experiences we have throughout our lives. And our bodies have a memory of those things and those become our triggers. And so that's why we respond to scenarios that like, you know, we're crying about boxes in the garage, probably not actually crying about boxes in the garage, doesn't matter what the story is, but we get stuck in these emotional stress loops. And it's as though over time, we have 30,000 browser tabs open and we wonder why we're tired and overwhelmed and burnt out. And we think like, oh, it's because I'm working too many hours. Maybe, maybe it's because no one ever taught you or sat with you and told you it was okay to just feel what you needed to feel until you could complete that experience and set that free from your body. And the, the way we begin to signal to our body that we're safe to create more expanded realities and to engage in behaviors that we would like to be engaging in, <laughs> whether it's starting your podcast, whether it's writing the pitch, writing the book, making the call. I don't know what you want to do, but whatever it is, we all have these things that we don't do that we want to do. And if we want to teach our bodies to feel safe to do them, we need to do exactly what Kathy did. 
which is be willing to just let the emotion wash through us. That actually is a met metabolic process. Like it's emotional metabolism that allows our thermostat of our nervous system to reset at a more expanded place because it's not holding so much fear. It's like a little fear bubble that you let go. And then you feel yep. safer to be healthier every time you do that. Right. And just to call myself out so that we have more of the juicy sort mm. of uh, reveal, because it's always so exciting actually and fun when you're like, oh, that's what that's about. Right. And as Kate said, it's very cyclical. So where she is having this conversation with you about where she's been, one of my cyclical things and anyone who knows me knows it because it's there it is is how often I move. There's a lot of moving. And so why I don't like to look in the garage is because I see all the moves. Like that was from that house. Then we moved again. Then we moved again. Then we moved again. And what gets really um, beautiful when you're willing to stop and catch up with yourself is there's wisdom there. Mm -hmm. And what came through for me is the same cyclical lesson, but in a more powerful way every time, which is when I was a kid in my living room at eight years old, there was this strategy of disassociation and one day I'll be somewhere else and then I can feel okay. So that's a good way to cope is to think about moving somewhere else and then as long as I know I'm going, I can handle what's happening now. And so then wherever I am, there's always something outsourced to, well, this is okay. But since there is some kind of stress or pain that I don't want to feel, I'll just move. Because obviously, if I had a different backyard or we had a different house or we lived in a different neighborhood, it'll feel better. And then I'll go again. And then there you are. So I'm constantly meeting up with that seven-year-old kid. And so for me, it's really beautiful to lean in and to find the courage to lean in um, because there's so much that's just trying to get your attention. And when you just lean into it, you get to let it go. And then you get to do the real work, um, which is finding yourself in the here and now and your okayness here mm -hmm. and now. And then you realize you don't need to buy anything else. If it was in Kate's scenario when she was yes, 22 exactly. and I don't need to move anywhere. You know, it's like, it's like, it's just always back bringing you back to what really the antidote is. If you're willing to sit and, and these tools and the fact that you're naming these tools is so important because if you don't realize that you don't feel safe and you don't have any way to a know that you don't feel safe or b make yourself feel safer you'll just keep avoiding it and you're right kate it's as simple as that you just don't feel safe so you keep telling yourself some some story so that you don't do the thing that feels uncomfortable i would love to talk about the money thing with you yeah in the next phase of your life you know you and i and many of us and I'm, we're all still working through it, but once you came through that part of your story, you had this whole other part of your money story open up where you started to have a flow of money yeah. and then there was more of it. And then there was like this milestone moment of here I am and I can make a million dollars, which for some reason, all of us have made that mean a lot. And then there was this feeling of like, oh, I'm telling myself now a new story that that's it. Don't make more than that because that could be triggering or scary or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think that no matter where we're all at, some of us might be now in that phase where you're in a certain place of flow, but you just can't seem to make more than a certain place. And that doesn't feel right either. So can you talk a little bit about that and type a one in the chat if you are in that place where you're not necessarily in debt at this point, you're okay, but you just feel like no matter what, you're making 78,000 a year or what's really left is this much or you're at 120 and you just want to break out of that yes, particular like plateau. You feel yeah. stuck at some kind of plateau. And um, this will happen for a variety of reasons, but I'll just tell you the story that I was living. And um, 
I know that there are some folks who will find this helpful because I just did a live event a week and a half ago and a woman came up to me and she literally told my story to me verbatim, but it was hers fundamentally. And that is this. My story is that I had grown up with relative class privilege, raised by two doctors. There was a lot of financial pressure and chaos, but like on the outside. <laughs> so like, just want to say the numbers don't really matter. It's how the, it's the story told about the numbers and how it feels as a result. So our, our bodies, our nervous systems, our unconscious do not do math. They speak in energy mm-hmm. and they speak in emotion. And so it's not about how much money there was. It's about how everyone felt about it. Yeah. I know a lot of people who grew up with a lot less than I did, who have a set point of much greater financial peace than I do by default. Mm -hmm. I have done so much to continue updating and I continue to do so. Okay. So I had been having, making just over a million, like maybe 1.2, sometimes 1.3, maybe 1.4 every year since 2017. And it was 2021. And, uh, you know, this is not like some kind of problem I'm going to be crying about on the internet, obviously. Um, no one cares, (laughs) but it was in terms of my, like, feeling of why is this? Like, what is this? Because I knew that there was a limitation there. And as somebody who spends my life exploring and then sharing what I learn, I knew that if I was having a limitation here, I was holding back for others as well. There are two lies that we all get indoctrinated with. One is the lie of separation and the other is the lie of scarcity. So, and these two lies are sisters. Mm Mm-hmm. They're evil sisters. (laughs) (laughs) The lie of separation tells us that what happens to Kathy somehow is separate from me. So like she's, her whole lived experience is completely separate out in Los Angeles. My whole lived experience is completely separate over here in Miami and, and they're separate. That's where jealousy comes from. That's where FOMO comes from. Do you know all these things? And then the lie of scarcity says there's not enough to go around. Now, it's one thing to hear from a spiritual perspective that the zero sum model is a lie and there's enough to go around, whatever. Unfortunately, like I've been, not unfortunately, I stand by this, but like I've done just a lot of reading about the world and I'm like really aware of inequity. And so I was just feeling like, yeah, but it really seems like there's not enough to go around when you look out at the world. And so it was really helpful for me to read two books and I'm going to recommend them to you. If you've been particularly tuned into the inequity in the world and you have guilt about the way your financial scenario is related to everyone else. And there's two books. One of them is called the Sum of Us by Heather McGee. And it is about racism in America and how the race inequity in America is fundamentally based on the lie of scarcity. Because, and that the truth is, the data shows us there's actually enough to go around. And it is the very thing, it is the lie of scarcity that tells us There's not enough to go around and therefore that creates greed and hoarding because you wouldn't over, you wouldn't take more than is necessary if you didn't believe there wasn't enough to begin with. So it actually has created the very lie in the first place. So Heather McGee, the sum of us, and then the other one is um, the soul of money by Lynn twist in which she talks about um, the data from Buckminster Fuller that there's enough resources on the planet for everyone to live a really good life. So we do have a distribution issue, but I'll tell you what, when I was there in 2021, wondering like, gosh, there's this ceiling. And I feel like because I've always had enough and because I've been judged 
and uh, taken down for a variety of reasons as someone who grew up semi in a public in a public capacity it felt unsafe for me to move beyond a level of receiving that i deemed completely arbitrarily by the way as okay <laughs> so i was like i can have a million dollar business but beyond that is just too much and not okay because then essentially what my body was feeling is if I go beyond that, they're, they're going to come after me. Then, then, then I'm going to be taken out. But if I can sneak under the radar, just at like abundant, but not like wildly, then, then that'll be okay. And what I realized, and it was in, in, in part, uh, a conversation that I had with you, Kathy, was that especially in my line of work, but this is true for all of us energetically, my ascribing to my aligning with the lie of scarcity was only furthering the lie of separation. Because if I'm around a woman who is holding back on what she will allow herself to receive, because we all are absolutely one, because we all are just waves in the same ocean, we are all made of ocean. We are all the ocean, we're just the separate waves, sort of, right? But you can't really determine between one wave or another and one molecule will be over here, one, right? So my holding back, I really got that it was holding back people in my world. Like literally, I'm very logical. I'm very like intellectual. Sometimes I wish I could turn this off, but I have to explain things to myself this way. Literally, I was like, oh, that's true. Because if I'm keeping a ceiling on my company's revenue, I don't have as much money to pay my employees. I don't have as much to give to organizations or to, let's pretend I wanted to like invest in a startup. Like I am literally because of the way the economy works and it's all about inflow and outflow and how we're all interconnected. I am holding other people back by deciding that I'm too scared to expand and that I'll be taken out if I expand beyond this certain level. And so it took a little bit, but that year I really worked on that edge and allow and, and signaling to my body that I was safe as I got up against an edge of maybe doing a more expansive behavior or taking myself a little more seriously or going to a networking event and like landing the introduction that I might give myself instead of underplaying or just all these various ways that we turn down the volume. And uh, yeah, every year since then, I will tell you the revenue keeps going up and it is wild because I have more and more people in my environment, in my programs, but also in my life who are expanding right alongside. Because it's not true that my experience is separate from somebody else's. We are all energetically interconnected and my expansion allows for literally and energetically somebody else's. And I certainly wasn't hold it, helping anybody out. I was just blocking the flow to an entire segment of the population that is connected to me. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's really such an important conversation because there's so many like thought monsters in there that are just, yeah. you know, like totally. standing, standing guard so that you can't cross this bridge. And it's like, they're not even real. You know, there's no redwood tree that even thinks about being as tall as it needs to be or thriving. Oh. And there's no animal in nature. That's like, Oh, like I shouldn't be flying this high or eating this much food because no, no, it's the opposite because the more the ecosystem thrives, the more the ecosystem thrives. And I also think it's really powerful. If I took a highlighter to your words, I would be circling several things you said. And one of them was, if I go beyond this, they're going to come after me. So it's really interesting because we will hold ourselves back from just the thought of other people's swords and judgment and yeah. their swords and judgment is their own scarcity problem being projected on fear. you and their own fear is enough to make you say, 
I'm not going to do that. And then you think about in this moment, if you think of a woman like Reese Witherspoon or Tamara Mellon or any, any, any girl who you've ever seen making money and thriving, I mean, what part of you goes, she's just disgusting. I've had it. And if there is that part of you, is that your higher self? No. Of course it's not, right? And what's interesting is when you really go back to the scarcity, anyone who would look over and be like, how dare that person have all the money? Why would they do that? Because they're thinking that that money is something that they would also like and that person has too much of it. And why do they think that? Because they've outsourced all their well-being and happiness to the pile of money. And that's the yes. most scarce thing you can think. Yes, I think one is. of the reasons why I've allowed myself to, like the money is just money is because it doesn't mean what other people make it mean. Like moving to Jerusalem and living in the old city and asking Rabbi Aaron, what's the most spiritual experience I can have today? And he said, go down the street, go to this address, knock on the door. This woman just became a widow. Ask if you can do her dishes. That will be the most spiritual experience you're going to have today. Like I take it to the bank, like my moment by moment, like the, 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 the abundance in my life is placed where it needs to be placed. Those people in the blue zones who are living the best lives, who are living thriving, connected to their communities, happy, they would not care because it's not abundant to them, some arbitrary amount of money. These are not places, people don't come back from blue zones and go, wow, you should see their Fifth Avenue. <laughs> no one makes that mean anything. What makes meaning for them, the reason they live till 111 is because it's the smile on their friends' faces and there's an abundance of good food and an abundance of joy and an abundance of everything great. No one's in the racket. So to me, all of that is like, so I'm going to worry about having more because of your judgment, which comes from the fact that you have put money on a pedestal. You value it so much that how dare I have it? That's what that's about. That's what that's about. When you really value what's really abundant, then you wouldn't keep yourself, like Kate's saying, from any resource because you'd want to be thriving as much as you can be thriving because that's your job is to be a receiver and to be as big a vessel as you can be, period. But that whole racket, it's like that has a lot to do with people who have valued and outsourced. They can't be happy because you got their money. Oh, they've got a lot of interesting things that they think then about what makes a person happy and what money really does. And that's the person who has a money issue. A hundred percent. And I think when we can really, it's so helpful to do this kind of excavation and to ask like, okay, but let me just get under the hood, right? Yeah. Like when you, you were so, you know, beautifully transparent talking about what's under the hood with the garage thing. And what, like what's under the hood for me was that feeling of like, they're going to come after me. And so then it's like, wow, okay, that doesn't make any sense. That's illogical. And I wish it were then as easy as then just being like, great. So I'm just not going to care anymore. And I'm going to think a new thought. What I know about most of our wiring is that actually our thoughts are results of our emotions and our yeah. emotions are a result of a signal our body is giving to our entire system because of the nervous system and its desire to keep us safe. And anything that the nervous system experiences as unfamiliar, it registers as unsafe. So it makes sense that we would find ourselves in facsimiles of our past experience, even though the details may have all shifted, it'll be like, wow, this feels like really freaking familiar. How is it that I left that toxic job and I thought I would whatever. And now here I am at a totally different company in a completely different country 
in the exact same freaking feeling. It's because unconsciously we will recreate the same experience. And so the name of the game is about noticing like, oh, wow, that's under the hood. So for Kathy, it's like, oh, oh, that's so interesting. I have a thing around safety and staying in the same place. Yeah. So that's under the hood. And then you know that. And then every time it's like, you're looking at Zillow or thinking, and by the way, like I have my own version of that regarding real estate and you and I can box about it later. <laughs> Can't wait. But we all oh, have these great. things that we do. So it's not that we're bad or wrong, but unfortunately we can't, most of the time, we can't just choose a thought that feels better. And instead we need to have compassion to, to like really get that there's a young part of ourselves that's stuck energetically and emotionally at a particular moment when we had experiences that we didn't have the support, yeah. the knowledge, the tools, the capacity to process. So we just got stuck there, scared. And so our body doesn't want to allow us to expand because it feels scared for the nervous system. It feels scary. But the good news is every time we do something, when we're at our edge and we're feeling like, I want to go do that behavior. I want to go have an entire bottle of wine and pass out by my, I want, like, I, I'm doom scrolling. I'm whatever. We all have our things, right? Or for me, it's like, I, I just want to have this small, simple business and make sure nobody really fully sees me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay, that's interesting. How can I let my body know that I am safe so that I can expand just a little bit more and that my body can then now experience like, oh, okay, now it is expanded. I have expanded my range of capacity to feel safe with a wider range of lived experience. And then that becomes my default setting. And then we don't have to work really particularly hard for that to become our life because it's our energetic blueprint. I mean, it's essentially the, the, the language in the science of the nervous system is how I understand the language in the science of manifesting and frequency and point of attraction. To me, it's like how neuroscience and somatics explains why manifesting works. I think this is, I can see it in the chat, just really getting us where we need to be, right? Like our mind is gonna like tell us that the thing in the way of us having more money is that we need to do something or connect with someone on LinkedIn or figure something out. <laughs> and as you said, it's really in, am I looking under the hood at what's really the thing that's in the way? Because when you and I were having the conversation in 2021, if you hadn't been courageous enough to really come and look at how uncomfortable that one piece was, no matter what you would do, you would just keep energetically holding yourself in a particular place. And that emotion would create a thought, which would lead you to a behavior, which would keep you in the same spot. So you said at the beginning of this um, call, and I want to be cognizant of keeping you for just the next five ish minutes, because your kids are home. It's a holiday today. It's president's day for us here. Um, but in the next company, but I'd like to in the next few minutes, I want to take you back to the best that you can to just share a few of those things you said, like, so what are the steps? Basically, you started yeah. with where we're at now, which is like to get to the safety to receive. Yes. So it's okay, perfect. Great. And we've really done a great excavation to get us to hear those steps. Thank you for bringing me back. <laughs> you went a lot of other places, but perfect. essentially it's been explaining, you know, through story, this, this process, which is a act an acronym that I have, SSS. So stop. Stop is the first one. So what I mean by that is we first have to notice the signs that we're dysregulated because an inability to receive is because we don't feel safe. And another way to say that is we're dysregulated. So our nervous system, we have now gone outside of our range of regulation and range of regulation just means how much life you can experience while 
feeling safe fundamentally. And so we want to, when we're out of that range of regulation, there's all sorts of behaviors, but anxiety lives there, overwhelm lives there, collapse, inability to take action, um, hyperactivity. We can go in hyper or hypo responses to being out of regulation, which is a whole other conversation. But for the purposes of today, we just have to stop and be like, oh, I don't feel safe. I'm dysregulated. It's not that I need to find a new strategy in to grow my business or to make more money. It's actually that I just, I don't feel safe because something's going on. Okay, great. So stop. Then the next S is signal safety. That's technically two S's, but we'll just mm -hmm. <laughs> so stop at step one. Step two is signal safety. So we can do this any number of ways. Um, I teach many of them. Sometimes I teach them on Instagram in my programs, but I will just teach you one right now, which is really easy, is just to notice gravity. So if you're sitting on a chair, notice what it feels like to sit on the chair and notice that gravity is just there for you right now. If you're standing like I am, I'm at a standing desk, I just can feel my feet on the ground and I can feel how gravity is holding me on the surface of the earth. I don't have to do anything to earn that. It, I don't have to do a thing to keep it happening. It's just happening. Here we are safe in this moment and noticing gravity and how it feels on our body is a wonderful way to signal safety. Now, for folks who haven't practiced this much, it may not be super fast. I'm not saying that noticing gravity is going to like stop a panic attack, but it might slow it down 3%, you know? And so over time, these things work, can work very quickly. So stop signal safety and then solve. So we have a tendency to be dysregulated and try to solve the problem. But when we solve a problem from a place of lack of safety, the solution we create will only perpetuate a dysregulated state because most of us are addicted on some level to our dysregulated states because we live in a profoundly dysregulated culture and it's designed that way. However, it is a revolutionary act to learn to feel safe inside yourself no matter what is going on outside, that is the ultimate power move. And that is plugging you into source with a capital S. So we stop, we signal safety, and then we solve. Or if there's not a problem, which often there actually isn't, once you're regulated, you savor. You just savor. You just savor whatever pleasure is available. Cup of tea, snuggles from your cat, looking out at a tree, a plant on your desk whatever. I love this. And I love that connection that if you try to solve from the place where you're not safe, then the solution you have will create more of that unsafety in your body. And to sort of bring it all back to what you began with and to the work you do, I think the last piece of this song that I just want to like put here, the last note is you started by talking about how for you it's, there's this body work. Mm -hmm. And then you talked about power in women and we've all read all these different memes on Instagram, but the, <laughs> the one that I like is that speed is far less important than direction. And I just feel like everybody's worried about speed and it's in the embodiment. It's in the direction, right? You can, if the sun rises in the East and sets in the West and you're running in the wrong direction, you ain't going to find a sunset no matter how far you run, unless you're headed in the right place. So I feel like the work you do is an invitation to women to understand that the direction is here. It's deep. It's not out here. It's here. Cause the more we go in, we actually, the slowing down is the speeding up. Yes. So can you just say 
something about that as maybe the invitation to understand that the productivity invitation is in the awakening of the power within. And you, I just feel do such a uniquely beautiful job of that in your work. So part of our addiction in our culture is to busyness. And this is very looped in with our relationship to money because we think that in order to make money, we have to work hard, or at least we've been, you know, that's the, that's the conditioning that we've received in order. If you, if you need, if you want to make more money, you got to work harder, trade hours for dollars, trade life force, right? There's some sort of sacrifice required. And actually what is true is that our bodies are nature and our bodies are designed with the exact same rhythm and pulse as everything in nature because we are nature. So like you mentioned the redwood, there's no rose in the garden. There's no, you know, dandelion in the field. <laughs> there's no banyan tree here in Miami that's thinking like, I better hurry up and do more. I haven't grown enough leaves today. I haven't grown enough branches. Oh my God, that tree is going to take, I've done more than them. I should feel bad. They are doing more than me. It's not, that's not happening. That's not how we were designed. That is cultural conditioning. And so the truth of our greatest work is actually, and the truth of our greatest resonance and our greatest uh, point of attraction for prosperity, for true abundance financially and otherwise, is actually by rooting into our true nature. And it is going inside. It is getting in our bodies. And for me, every time I am truly diving deep inside, what I find is God. And you may have a different kind of relationship with that word. So you use the divine, the universe, whatever life force source. I like source also because at the center of it, the same thing that we all came from is the same thing that all of nature came from. And we are designed to be infinitely creative. We are designed to be infinite receivers. We are designed to be vessels for beyond what we can possibly imagine. If you are, and this is just a metaphor, you don't have to have actually given birth for this to be true, but for those of us who have had babies, we know that there was not a logical process of bringing that baby into our bodies and then forming it and then it coming out. It is the wild it's like experience of non-doing doing. And that is how we are designed because every single one of our bodies was formed that exact way. That is the blueprint for life on earth is creation through receiving and through partnership with the divine and partnership with life force. It's so powerful. I was just thinking how, as you were sharing the birth piece, we went through a fertility journey and the doctor we had, my husband called him the Zen master because many doctors before him had told me like, based on these numbers, I don't think this is going to happen. And he was like, oh, this will happen. It's just we're going to be throwing things into the cocktail and we'll see. And eventually I said, well, why is this not happening yet? And he said, oh, cause um, I'm not God. I didn't know if you knew that. Um, <laughs> and he goes, but my job as a doctor is really the same job of any doctor, which is I'm just here to help you. The two of us together are trying to create the conditions for facilitating the best space. That's all we can do. And that is the same thing with what we're talking about when it comes to our creativity. Our only job is to create the best conditions to facilitate what we are going to receive. What's the next download? That actually is our only job. <laughs> and then from there, wild things happen. Like there's three humans in my house right now, humans, people right? So a business could come through, right? 
a new idea of a connection of let's call Kate. And then that conversation leads to just a beautiful awakening. All that has to come just by me creating the conditions and facilitating the space. That's it, creating the space. And I want you to say this one last thing, because I quote it all the time in your book about anyone who's ever worked the land knows. Oh, yeah. So anyone who's ever planted a plant, planted a garden, grown something, knows that there are seasons for everything. There's a planting season, there's a sprouting season, there's a harvest season, and there's a fallow season. But we work in our culture as though we are meant to be in perpetual harvest. It makes no sense. We are seasonal creatures. We are cyclical creatures. We too are designed to have a season for planting, a season for blossoming, a season for harvest, and a season for rest. And when we work in that way with our projects, with our months around our menstrual cycle or the moon, with the year, when we work in that way, we're actually aligning with the truth of who we are. And the truth of who we are is nature, which is the most inherently abundant system we could possibly model. And we don't even have to model it. We are it. I, I Every seven seconds, you say something that is what I could say. If you only learned this, you got it all. Because there's many things that you say that just have such impact. And that was one of those many really important things. We live in a culture that tells you every single day, why don't you have something to post on Instagram that proves your worthiness and existence? Every day, why don't you have a headline? Every single day, what's new, what's next? And when I read Kate's book, it was just so powerfully stated. And I was thinking about how we just rip things in America from the ground all the time. Every day is a harvest. Every day, every day, everything's in season, right? Every single day, you can get a tomato. Every single day, you can get a watermelon. Every single, every day. And then when you go to Europe and you eat a tomato, you don't need anything. You don't need balsamic. You need nothing. It tastes different. Why? Oh, because they only harvest it after it's composted for so long. And then it's ready to come out. It tastes so different than the tomatoes that we like push, push, push to sort of produce, produce, produce. It's like, so you in your life have fallen into the conditioning of, I need to quickly get something out and ship the work and post it and push it. And cause I'm behind, I'm so behind. And it's like, well, you can make those gross tomatoes or you can go compost what God put within you that needs your attention to cultivate. And then what you make is actually so major and it moves the world and it tilts the access of everything because it's so nourishing rather mm. than this, the speed at which we make nothing and everyone's running everywhere and getting nowhere. Mm. And that is the work that you facilitate, Kate, in such a major, beautiful way. I'm so grateful to you. You've helped so many women to heal and to thrive. Tell everybody where they can follow you. People want to get on your newsletter. There's content. You do these incredible courses. Just tell everybody where they can be part of it. Yeah. So I think the best place is if you go over to Instagram and you just send me a DM with the word melt, M-E-L-T, that is going to give you something called the pressure relief kit. So if you have been liking this conversation around the nervous system, around our seasons and cycles, around the way our bodies can be portals to our truest, most sustainable abundance, that guide is my six best strategies I think at least three of them are embodiment strategies for <laughs> releasing the sense of pressure without any of your external environment needing to shift. And so you'll get that if you just send me a DM on Instagram at Kate Northrup. It appears that uh, somebody went to go sign up for my newsletter and the page was broken. So don't do it on my website. I'll be going to fix that. Oh my God, the internet. But if you send me a DM on Instagram, it's working. So melt is the word to send. So, and I'd love to have you over there. And then um, I've got a podcast called Plenty um, that if you like this conversation, I think you'll love that one too, those two. 
I love you. Thank you so much I for you, your energy. So it's such a beautiful gift and we received it and thank you and go enjoy your girls. And um, we'll be following along. What a, what a actual delight you are. Thank you. Thank you. So are you. Thank you, everyone. It's so good to connect. I look forward to more soon. Bye. Thanks, Kate.